Hi, welcome to Sabbath School Daily, where we have been studying from this lesson right here, God's mission, my mission. This week we're studying from lesson number five, which has the title, Excuses to Avoid Mission. And today is Monday's lesson, which has the title, Our Excuses, False Views. The false view that we find here in the story of Jonah is one that not only applies to him, but to the sailors which are with him on the ship going to Tarshish. They face a huge storm and they cast lots to find out who is inflicting that storm upon them. These were extremely superstitious people. I need you to understand that back then, human beings understood the world very differently than we understand it now. They had no access to technology. They had no access to information, information about the weather, about geology, about why fires happen, why earthquakes happen, why hurricanes or tornadoes happen, why famines happen, why floods happen. They did not understand the why of these events. And so in their limited worldview, they understood these events as the actions of gods, of deities. And every location had a different deity. The sea had its own God. The mountain had its own God. The land had its own God. The winds, the earth, the sun, the stars, the moon. They understood the ebb and the flow of nature as the battle of these gods. One day when it was hot and the land was going through a drought, the sun God was winning. Another day when there was a lot of rain and there was flooding, the rain God was winning. When there was an earthquake, the earth God was winning. And so you see that that's how they understood these, uh, these deities. And so each people had their own God, their own main gods, according to where they lived. You'll remember that in Egypt, the main God was Ra, the sun God, because they lived in a very hot place, a place where the sun was very prevalent. You'll remember that the Philistines, they had Dagon, the fish God, because they were a seafaring, a coastal uh, population, a coastal people. They lived along the coast. And that's how life was back then. In addition to all that, everything revolved around fertility. They had to survive. And so that's why they would have so many different rituals celebrating the sexuality of these gods in order to acquire favor with them so that they could be fertile. Their lands would be bountiful. Their herds would grow. They would have a large population. That's how the world was understood. And so here with these sailors, they are casting lots to find out who had angered the sea god. And when Jonah says that he serves the Lord God of heaven and earth, the God that made the earth and the sea, these sailors were extremely terrified and scared because they had someone who had angered that God. He was running away from them. We literally see that in Jonah chapter one, verse 10, that says, then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, why have you done this? For the men knew that he had fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then they said to him, what shall we do to you that the sea may calm for us? For the sea was growing more tempestuous. And he said to them, pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will become calm for you. For I know that this great tempest is because of me. Here we see that Jonah might have been a little influenced by his surroundings. Because while I don't believe that he believed in these other gods and these pagan gods, he might have believed that if he were turned over, that if he were sacrificed, then that would spare these other sailors. Here Jonah reveals a victimization mentality. He was the one that was causing this. He was the victim here. He was the one who had caused this. Oh, woe is me. What shall I do? Throw me over. I deserve it. And so that's what Jonah is revealing here. But it seems that by chapter two, he was cured of this false view because look at what he says in verses one through three and then seven through 10. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord, his God from the fish's belly. And he said, I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction. And he answered me out of the belly of Sheol. I cried and you heard my voice for you cast me into the deep into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your billows and your waves passed over me. And then from verse 7 to 10, that says this, When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer went up to you, into your holy temple. Those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy. But I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay what I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. So the Lord spoke to the fish and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. It's interesting that when Jonah is running away from God, the word that is most recurrent is down. He is spiraling down into his own misery because he's running away. And when he turns back to the Lord, the word then changes. It switches to up. He goes up out of the fish, up to Nineveh. And so we see that when someone comes back to God, they're going up. In any case, what does this have to do with today's lesson, which has to do with false views? Just as Jonah had several false views about mission, we can also maintain several false views about what we should do. The lesson provides two examples. The first one says, 
One common misunderstanding is that God's desire for us is to focus on our own salvation and to remove ourselves from the wickedness of the world around us. Though we are instructed to keep ourselves unspotted from the world, our focus should be on how we can bring God's blessings and hope to those in need. I mentioned this in last week's lesson when I said that many times we think that we have to go out into the middle of nowhere to run away from the corruptedness of the world. Friends, how will we minister to the world if we're not close to anyone? The mission in the Bible, the message of the Bible is to go into the cities, into the towns, into the places where there is darkness and we have to be a light. We should reach them. In this time, close to the end, before the close of probation, we can live in a rural setting, but on the outskirts of the cities, still close enough where we can go in, minister to those living there, but not be in constant contact to them. If you can do that, of course, that's ideal, but not all of us can do that. Not all of us have the means to do that. Is that wrong? By no means. We are in a situation where we do need to pray more not to be influenced, for our families not to be influenced and corrupted by the world around us, but for us to be the influencing factors in this world, for us to be the ones doing the influencing. So pray to the Lord to show you, to reveal to you, and to give you the means, if that's the case, of living that. But if not, ask him to empower you and your family to be good influences in your community, in your neighborhood, in your school, in your work. That's what our prayer should be. Never think that God's mission for us is to run away from the mission to go out to the middle of nowhere and live as hermits, that might be comfortable for us, but what about those who are perishing? What about those that could be saved had it been our influence upon their lives? Think about that. This is important. Another excuse that's mentioned here as a false view is another misunderstanding that stops us from accepting God's call into mission is believing that success depends on ourselves. We can no more save a soul than Jonah could save Nineveh. We can have a savior mentality about mission. Our call is not to do the saving, but to cooperate with God in his saving work. We're not the saviors. We're not the Messiah here, friends. We give testimony praising God for specific ways he is changing us, but only God can draw people to himself. We can plant seeds of truth, but only God can convert the heart. We often confuse our role with God's, which is enough to make anyone find an excuse not to witness. Yes, God used Jonah, but only God, not Jonah, turn Nineveh around. Friends, I mentioned this again in last week's lesson. We are not called to be God's lawyers. We're not called to be God's defenders. We're called to be witnesses. We're called to share what we have seen in our own life and in the life of those who we love. Never confuse disability with disqualification. In the Bible, disability, the fact that we're unable to do certain things is not an excuse. It's not synonymous to disqualification. We are only disqualified when we choose to disqualify ourselves. Otherwise, the Lord can use anyone. There is no excuse. There is no disability. There is no reason not to go into mission and to use whatever God has given us or whatever life has taken away. Trust me, God is more powerful. I've said this once. I'll say it a hundred times. Our disabilities don't limit God. Our great abilities don't really help him all that much. What God wants is our availability. Make yourself available. No excuses, no wrong views. Go out into this perishing world and be an instrument in his hands, a conduit of blessings to those around you. May the Lord bless you as you study your lesson. Today's was a very important one. We have several false views. We can mention a bunch more, but I'll leave that up to you in your study, in your personal uh, devotion to think up what are the excuses that you have given, what are the wrong views that you have upheld in your own life. Please comment down below with any questions or any comments. I'd love to interact with you. Please remember to like, to share, and to subscribe to our videos. We release one every day, and I hope to see you again here tomorrow for another Sabbath School Daily.